You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to Garibaldi Red, the Nottingham Forest podcast from Nottinghamshire Live. Uh, my name's Matt Davis. I've just heard my own voice on the trailer, which uh, I hate the sound of, so that might throw me off kilter a bit. But welcome to everyone for our latest episode, where we are joined by Reds correspondent Sarah Clapson. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Hello. I'm okay, Matt. How are you? Uh, very well, very well. We've got a special guest, a distinguished guest in Reds legend, Gary Birtles. Good afternoon, Gary. First time I've been what? called that. Yeah, very oh. distinguished. You're a gentleman, a gentleman in Nottingham. So, yeah, welcome to um, the podcast again, Gary. Uh, second time here. You, uh, For people watching, there's another episode with Gary, which is really good, talking about his career and playing under Brian Clough and uh, all the stuff uh, from when he was playing for England, Forest and May United. So people can go check that out in the feed but in the meantime at the moment we're streaming on facebook so if people want to uh, join in the comment section as normal and put questions to gary and sarah and comments we'll uh, bring a few up as we go along i suppose though we should start with the big news of yesterday which was the departure of Jao carvalho on a seasonal loan to almeria if i'm saying that or almeria in spain um sarah why don't you just start by telling people about the details is it an option to buy or anything like that Yes, season long loan um, with an option for um, Almeria to buy at the end of that. Um, yeah, it, 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 he always polarises opinion of it, um, Yao Carvalho. Great player. I, I really like him. Big fan. Huge, huge talent. Um, I just don't think he, he's done it quite consistently enough for Forrest. Um, he's had a few chances. I mean, you can say that he's, he's not had a... Um, a regular run of games that probably didn't help and he's not been in his his favoured position a lot but I still think he didn't quite have that consistency that he needed um no question about that he's a, a massively massively talented player though um so it's a shame to see him go but I think at this point it was probably right for for all parties maybe he needed a fresh start he wasn't going to look in this season he wasn't playing um he was training separately. Um, so I think he, more than anything for him, he, he just needed a, a new start. And hopefully he does well. Hopefully he goes there and um, realises his potential. What was your take on him, Gary, from watching him for the a former player's eye? What did you make of Carvalho in, in a Forest shirt? Frustrating to say the least, but I've got a bit of sympathy for him because you look at the nature of the way Forest play, which has been very negative... We're under the last what three three managers, um, and he, he's he's that sort of player who makes things happen in the final third. And when you're only playing one up front and you sit on the back foot for most of the game, and then you try and counter attack, I think it's very difficult for a player like him to get involved on a regular basis. You know, clearly he's got ability. Um, there was no real end product, but the reason for that was because very few people were getting into the box. You know, we're, the way Forrest set up was Lewis grabbing up front and that's it. You know, there's no plan B, very rarely from any other managers. I mean, the situation is we saw last season, Forrest were behind in two games and they only came back um, to win. No, they, they only came, they were behind in, they won two games they were behind in uh, all season, Luton and Stoke. So when they go behind, they're very difficult to come back and win a football match. And that, that is really damning. And for a player like Cavalio to come in and play in a system like that, I think is very difficult. So I hope he goes on and he, he proves people wrong because it'd be sad because a player of his ability can very easily get bogged down, lose his confidence and just disappear. And you don't want players like that to do that. Just looking at the comments, lots coming in about Karanka. Uh, Karanka sorry, Carvalho. Uh, Owen Bailey says Karanka built the team around him and he looked good. Other managers haven't given him much chance, which kind of echoes what Gary was saying. And also, um, Dan Smith played well under Karanka in a weaker side and suffered under negative managers. I kind of think or wonder, I don't know if victim's the right word, but obviously, Forest have had this scattergun approach of signings over the last three years. I don't think they, anyone could dispute that when you look at the number of players they've signed. Um, and he did fit under Karanka, and they've not really bedded him in uh, or found a way to utilise him in the next two managers. I put on Twitter, I'd love to see him playing under Paul Hart, that kind of team, the way Forrest went about it. Do you feel 
a bit sorry for him, Sarah? Or do you think there's always the onus on a player to actually adapt to, to the manager? I think there's there's probably a bit of both. I do I do feel a bit sorry for him. Um, I think if he'd been given a kind of free role and given free reign to kind of do what he wanted a little bit, you might have seen more from him um, and you might have got the best out of him. But that's not the way that, that Forrest have been set up. Um, and yes, it, it, there is then kind of the onus on the player to, you know, to fit around what the manager wants because ultimately, you know, it's the manager who's in charge. He says he outlines the plan and, and tells the players what he wants. Um, I, yeah, I feel a bit of sympathy for for um, for Yao. Probably a bit like Gary says. I think you he's such a good player that you either kind of build a team around him and you make everybody fit around him, um, or you you just you kind of use him a little bit and don't perhaps get the best out of him. Um, and yeah, I think probably a, a move away was um, was right for him at the moment. Uh, David Hoyle says, Gary, get your boots on. How many minutes are in your legs these days, Gary, would you say? Not a great deal, I'm afraid. I, I, <laughs> wait. Somebody was, well, I, was, I went out from a walk the other day and there was a couple walking the dog and he was kicking a tennis ball around and he kicked it near me. He said, oh, that, that, uh, he's all right. That lad will go and sort it out. Uh, he can play. And I said, oh, that was a very long time ago. I said, I wish I could get my boots on now. But I don't, I don't possess a pair of boots. Um, I think the last ones I had were in Grimsby Docks. <laughs> uh, when I finished there, I, th I think I got thrown in Grimsby Dock. So, uh, yeah, without football boots, but, I'd, you know, the mind's still willing, without a doubt. Um, you watch quite a lot of European football, Gary, for Sky over the years. Do you think Carvalho might be uh, might flourish in Spain with a kind of different style of football over there? Well, I did a lot of Spanish games for Sky uh, when, when they had the contract for it. And, yeah, he would fit into that, without a doubt. Um, like Sarah said, I think she's right. You, you've got to try and maybe make him feel welcome, make him feel like he's the focal point, that everything revolves around him a little bit. And he's a he's a positive player. He's a talented player. And you get restricted in a ne uh, negative setup when you're that sort of player. Everything's expected of you to do everything, to, to create things. But when you've got only one player more or less in the box all the time, which is Lewis Graben, you know, you struggle to pick people out. You know, you look good until you get to the edge of the box and then people are saying, right, make something happen. They're looking for him to stick one in the top corner every time he gets the ball or pick a great pass out or, or cross. That wasn't always possible. I always used to count the number of bodies in the box. And look, time after time, you know, you saw there was one in there, one just arriving very late. And you can't expect a player, no matter how good he is, you know, even in the Premier League, to be able to do that. I watched Liverpool the other night against Arsenal. And the game they played, it's just unbelievable. It's how good you are without the ball. Liverpool were brilliant without the ball and the press they had high up the pitch just was phenomenal. I mean, it's Liverpool, the better players. But you can introduce that to, you know, a, your championship team. You know, we saw the three teams that went up deservedly went up because of the way they played. You know, they were positive. They got players forward in the final third. There was always an option for the man on the ball. And if Carvalho was in a side, any one of those three sides, I think he would, might have flourished. But unfortunately, he, he played under negative managers. Uh, last Carvalho comment I'll just flush up from Simon Whitehouse. An exceptional talent who we find a system from in the future. We'll see about that, Simon. Uh, so that's eight minutes talking about Carvalho or me waffling at <laughs> the start. Let's um, talk about the other potential outgoings. Forrest have got like 30 five players or something now. Um, Sarah, who else do you think could go? Figueredo, still has been mentioned, a couple of right-backs. What do you think we'll see in the next few days? I think we'll see a lot of departures in the next few days. They need to get rid of a lot of players. It's a really top-heavy squad at the moment and there's a lot that are, are not part of the manager's plans. They're not part of the first-team setup. There's a few who, like um, Carvalho, are training separately at the moment and getting those kind of players' moves is probably easier said than done because they haven't been playing a lot of them. Um, I mean, Gaten Bong, for instance, he's played that one game. Um, he's he's not part of um, Sabri Lamucci's plans, but trying to, to find a move for him is probably going to be difficult because nobody's going to be up, nobody's seen him. Um, same with Zach Clough, he's not played for a long time now. Um, Michael Heffler, another one, Johan Benelouen. Um, there's quite a few that Forrest have... They've been there for a while who haven't 
been in the picture, um, but Forest haven't been able to get moves for them. Um, I mean, they'll obviously try before the deadline, but again, I think a lot of them, it's easier said than done. Um, Albert Adoma is another one. Um, I'm trying to think now, there's quite a few. Um, equally, they need to get rid of a, a couple of, probably a couple of right backs. And um, they've got four at the moment. There's talk of um, Tendai Dariqua or and or Carl Jenkinson going on loan. Um, Tobias Figueiredo understand that he, for non-footballing reasons, he'd favour a move back to Portugal. Um, you can't argue with that one, I don't think, um, if that is the case. Um, I think there's, there's probably a bit of doubt about Yuri Ribeiro as well, the, the speculation around him and um, a move to Le Olympiacos. That one doesn't seem to go away. Same with Thiago Silva. So I think probably in the next few days, we're going to see quite a few heading out to the exit door. Gary, if you're a footballer on uh, 10, 20, 30 grand a week and you're told you've got to take a pay cut to go somewhere else, uh, I know what you do. What, do you understand why some players might be reticent to go out unless it's on loan where someone else tops up their wages or something? Well, that was going to be my point. Agents will say to their players, right, you don't have to go anywhere. You're on very good money here. And there lies the problem with most football clubs. You know, every football club has that that problem. They have a lot of players. Some won't go on loan. Some don't want to. They'll just sit there, pick the money up, and you know that's it. So it becomes very difficult, and that wage bill has got to be very, very high at the moment. And you, you talk about people like Silver. He's another one who you thought, well, yeah, what a, what a great ability he's got. But again, it, I think it's similar to Carvalho with him. He's he's in a negative setup where he wants to be a positive player. And he's being restricted. You can see them, you know, they're desperate to get forward, get in, in, in good areas, create things for other people, but they're not being allowed to. And the, the number of players they've got at the moment is just absolutely ridiculous. And if you carry on with that workload, with that number of players, with that wage bill, you know, sooner or later, maybe the, the owner might just get a little bit fed up of it. And uh, it's difficult to see a way around it when you have got the agent saying, right, you don't have to go anywhere. You're on this money. Just stay there. Not a problem. Sarah, I was going to ask you about a couple of potential incomings, even though Forest have signed 12 players. Um, is this Cafu one going to happen in terms of a swap for Silver, do you think? That sounds like it's pretty likely. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably uh, there's probably something in that one. Um, I know there's people questioning why they need another central midfielder, but... <sighs> Yes, they have got a lot, but equally, I mean, Sam Basal probably isn't going to play every game. He's still struggling with his knee problem. Um, they've got um, Fouad Bashiru. He's out with injury at the moment. So I know it's another central midfielder, but obviously it's part. it looks like it's going to be part of the deal that sees um, Thiago Silva heading in the opposite direction. So... In incomings and outgoings, I think they're still looking for a winger. That's definitely a priority. I think they they really need to strengthen there um, because they they need some more creativity. They need somebody that can help create goals and help score goals because they haven't got any yet. Uh, Kamal Grzycki, Sarah, is the name that's um, coming up. Darren Price mentioned that in the questions. Uh, fairly far back. And Kamal Grzycki is a name that's been linked quite a few times, going back to O'Neill. Uh, is that one that you wouldn't be surprised by then when you mention wingers? No, not at all. I think he's someone that's been on the radar for quite a while. Um, it's no surprise to see his name crop up again. Um, he'd be, I mean, he'd be a decent signing, I think. He's obviously got great experience. Um, I guess we just have to wait and see whether that one comes off or not. What about the general volume of signings, Gary? If you're a player in the dressing room, I asked this to David Prutton last week about how would you react to 12 players coming in? Uh, if this had happened when you were playing it, how would you have embraced that? The, the way I always did, you know, it's, you've got to be a really good player to get my position and, and keep me out of the team. You know, when Trevor Francis came in, uh, all the pressure was on myself and Tony Woodcock. But, you know, you strive to say, right, I'm going to train, I'm going to play well. And you, you, if you get in, you'll have to be playing extremely well to to get me out. And uh, that's the only way you can look at it as, as a player. That's the way you should look at it. And I hope everybody's professional enough to do that as players now. Um, you know, sometimes you see Gareth Bale's got a lot of stick about 
you know, preferring golf and not wanting to play over there and things like that. And I think the, the modern game is very different to when we played because the money is, you know, a hell of a lot more. We just played the game because we love playing football. You know, I, I couldn't wait to get out on the football pitch. And I was lucky enough to get that opportunity to do that after laying floors for a living. You know, so that that was just a, a massive incentive for me to go and want to succeed where it's a little bit diff different now. The, the players' wages are di massively different. And I haven't got a problem with that. That's not their fault. You know, they, you, know you, you, you can't help when you're born. You know, you get paid a lot of money for, for doing the game now. And, yeah, fair play to them. If, if they earn it, you know, I go back to Liverpool. I watched that performance the other, the other day and you see players at the top of the profession loving everything they do and earning the money and not worrying about the money as much. They're desperate to win things. And that's the mentality I love. That Liverpool mentality has always been there. And, uh, you know, we had that when we played. And I think that's gone out the game a little bit because the money is so high and so good. Uh, you know, you can get individuals who just think, well, OK, you know, I'm getting paid this much money. Don't care if we win anything. I'm still getting the money. And, you know, it, it's easy to get into that sort of, frame of mind it's not my frame of mind but you know i can i can see that money can turn heads in uh, any walk of life and uh, it's sad because you only get one opportunity to play football in your career and uh, you know i wouldn't change when i played for the world no matter how much money was in there and uh, yeah it's uh, it, it, it's a strange one at forest at the moment a lot of players in there 35 players how do you accommodate all those players how do you keep that many players happy and part of the squad and on a positive note? It's it's so difficult. Uh, lots of questions coming in, so I apologise if I haven't got to them yet. We'll kind of wade through them as we go. I wanted to ask um, Gary, obviously last time you came on, I think it was pre-season. Um, results have been dire. How, what have you made of just performances? Have they been as bad as the results, do you think, from what you've seen? I think the best bit of performance we saw was probably the when we went to up front um again was it against cardiff when we were mm. two mm. went two nil down second half was just unbelievably better didn't create many chances we looked like we we're going to create chances uh, but when you defend like we did for a, a set piece and we know what keeper moore's like he was in forest radar as well at one point i believe you know you get your best player marking him your best header of the ball marking him and the second goal, you know, that you, when you're giving goals away like that, to bounce back from them is very difficult in a game. And I thought Lamushi might be a little bit more positive after going to up front in the, the game afterwards, the Huddersfield game. But he, he took a uh, striker off and put Graven on. You know, what's the point? You're losing the game. And that's why Norwich got relegated from the Premier League. You know, everybody's saying, well, they played, you know, a lovely way, Pookie up front. But every time they went behind... They substituted him and put another guy on up front and kept the same system. You know, so in that respect, you deserve what you get because you're predictable. You're not going to get out of a situation by doing exactly the same thing. And I think uh, Lamucci against Huddersfield surprised a lot of people by doing that. And you've got to be brave sometimes. We're not brave at the moment. And when you're on the back foot all the moment, all the time, trying to defend situations and hold on to one goal leads, you know, that, that pressure becomes very intense indeed. You can't do it consistently. And things have to change. I think there's a scattergun effect when we go behind. You know, right, or we'll throw three subs on, but we don't know what they're going to do. Um, you know, let's just hope one of them does something for us. You didn't see any plan to it. And, uh, you know, that's the disappointing thing. There's got to be more positivity with a squad that big. You know, try and mix it up. You mentioned a winger coming in. Where's he going to play, you know, apart from on the wing? But what system is he going to play if he plays? You know, what system is Lamushi going to play with a the winger there? Is he going to play 4-3-3? You know, to accommodate a winger, you have to change your system a little bit instead of one up front. So it'll be interesting to see if a winger does come in and, and where he fits in and how the, he fits into the system that he's going to play. What did you make of... Looking at specifics and the, the Huddersfield game, Sarah, what did you make of the midfield balance with Arta, Colback and Sow? Three fairly similar players, in a sense. Uh, Arta was probably the most advanced of the three. What did you make of the balance uh, that Forrest had in that game? I thought 
first half, Forest looked all right. I, I actually thought they did okay first half. Um, second half, they were. It was just so flat and so. Um, they just didn't offer anything. It was just back to being kind of really. They were struggling. Um, I, I think they're really lacking confidence at the minute. They're lacking that conviction. So even even when they do get chances, and they did have some at Huddersfield, um, same as they've had some in the other games. You know, on an, another day it could have been different, but. They're just not taking them. They're just not looking, probably like Gary says, brave. They're, they're just not having that that conviction when they're they're in front of goal to put the ball in the back of the net and when they get in good positions to make it count. Um, I think that, that he, he did change the system on Friday. He went 4-3-3. Three, three. Um, Lyle Taylor was still really isolated, even... You know, even though they did Derek didn't look like a four three three. He didn't. No, he didn't. He you didn't. know, four three three is what Liverpool play. Yeah, that's a four three three. That's a proper four. We're talking about yeah. Premier League here, but I'll go back to when we played, and people can say, "Oh, you're you in the past, this, that, and the other." But you look at things that work, and you know, I remember the Liverpool side, Rush and Dalglish. Graham, I think somebody was it Graham Sumas mentioned Ian Rush the other day, or somebody did, saying he defended from the front. You know, even in those days. Uh, and he would fit into that Liverpool team now, which he would without a doubt. And the fullbacks in Liverpool, the, the, they cause all the problems because mm. they get forward, they push on, and they've got the conviction to do that and still win the ball back in the opponent's half because they commit people forward. We don't commit people forward, you know, in the Forest team at the moment. And teams find it very easy against us to play out from the back because Lewis Graben never, you know, he never chases across the line and tries to close you know, um, uh, back four down. At least Taylor, do, you know, you, do, you see him work, his work rate is, is quite intense. He tries to uh, close off that avenue to stop players playing from, out from the back. And you've got to give him credit for that. But like you say, he was isolated again, even in this so-called 4-3-3. Uh, our four four two when we had John Robertson and Martin O'Neill on the other side, we had John McGovern, who, you know, was the, the protector, who, you know, he wasn't allowed to come possibly over the halfway line as much as he'd want to. But then we had players like Ian Bowyer and Archie Gemmell from midfield who would go beyond the strikers, you know, pass the strikers and cause defenders problems. You know, who then picks them up? If you've got a lazy midfield player who doesn't come with them, then you're in trouble. Then, you know, the, the onus comes on the back four. But you don't see any midfield of our players go past the striker. You know, it, it just doesn't happen. And the onus then becomes on Lewis Graben maybe to keep scoring goals and he's missed quite a few chances early on in the season. His his confidence will go a little bit with that. And, you know, the pressure has always been on him more or single-handedly to, to score the goal. So the onus has got to be passed along the line to other players from midfield. Don't just rely on him all the time to be able to get us out of trouble. What about the back four then, Sarah? All, all changed. There was a lot of criticism of the full-backs. And I, to be fair, I thought they were pretty average on the night what about uh that and the back two how did you think ember so and uh mckenna did i actually thought they did okay i thought as a, a partnership they look all right um lower cambay so looks like he could be a really good player um given time i think he, he could be a decent find for for forest um and that partnership with scott mckenna worked really well they both seemed pretty comfortable on the ball um they they both look quite cool and composed given it was their you know their debuts and both of them their first experience of championship football um i thought probably like like you said that the two fullbacks it, it didn't really work um tyler black it didn't have the best of games at left back um but he, he did at qpr he played there at qpr and i thought he did all right so i'm i'm not sure that you could completely write that what that one off um cyrus christie started okay but faded a bit as the the game went on um but I don't think we'll see too many changes to that on Saturday. Um, I can't. I mean, maybe Nicholas Ione will come in and make his debut at left back. But otherwise, I would expect those three: Lower Cambay, so Scott McKenna, and, and Cyrus Christie to start again. Um, because you can change your back four too much. They at times they look like a, a group of, of strangers, which is essentially what they were because that you know they barely had any time to train together. Scott McKenna had signed that that week just a few days earlier um so th they hadn't really got used to playing with each other and they made a sloppy mistake that was kind of what cost the goal um and 
you know, they could have had another one towards the end. But overall, I thought those two did all right. McKenna and Lower Combe, so. Here's a challenge for you both. I should have told you to have a pen and paper, and this is for everyone who's watching then. Um, can people name their best 11 out of the current squad in the comments? And I'll ask Gary a question, and then Sarah can think of her best 11, and then I'll give Gary a bit of time to think about it. Um, the question for you, Gary, then, is you, you play centre-half late in your career. How hard is it to play not just with a new central defensive partner, but two new fullbacks as well? That's quite a big ask of them to, to come in, isn't it, McKenna and Emberso, and have a whole new back four around them? I, I thought, like Sarah, I thought the two centre-halves did particularly well, especially bringing the ball out from the back. Uh, they came across the halfway line, they were productive. Um, and I, I think the fullbacks have got to be a bit more proactive as well to be able to do that. Uh, I think they're going to be a danger in the opposition's box as well, the two centre-halves, if the service is anything like as good as it should be. Um, it's it's difficult to pick a best 11 at the moment out of 35, mm. isn't it, though? Mm, um, you know, trying they've really. played so far, it's been... I mean, you just got to say, right, hold on a minute, we've played, what, is it five games now, including the Cup? No goals, no points. You know, the only saving grace at the moment is that Derby are below us. <laughs> you know, it's, um, uh, and that's the only thing you, you Forest fans can look at and maybe have a little smile about. But it's not about you know where Derby are; it's about where Forest are. And yes, we had a, a real upset at the end of last season, but professional players have got to get that out of the systems. And you know, you've got to forget about things like that, and and you know, try and do everything you possibly can on the training pitch, and then take it out with confidence onto the pitch. And if you if you can't do that, then you know he's got to look elsewhere. Have you done yours, Sarah? <laughs> I'm still thinking. I mean, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Um, I can tell you the goalkeeper. <laughs> I've done one. I've got. I'll, I'll, let's okay, go on. I'll do I'll mine. What, going, just, just going back to your main point about the back four. When I played centre half, I, I found it quite easy. I mean, there was talk about me getting called up to play for England, and because I, I love centre half, because as a striker. I, you know, I knew where the set forward was going to run. But what I did as a centre-half as well, I played at Grimsby with a lad called Paul Futcher, uh, who was great on the ball as well. And we talked, we shouted, we cajoled. You know, we, yeah, I did that at Notts County when I played at the back and when I played at Forest. Because if you're vocal and you, you're trying to organise your back four, your, your full-backs, telling them to tuck in, you know, telling them to go forward or drop back, I'll go, you know, if you're vocal and you show leadership, uh, out on the pitch, and I don't think Forest have got that particularly. I don't think they've got that vocality in the right areas. Um, I, I was staggered last season to see Michael Dawson never at the end of the season be bought on or played because <clears throat> of his experience. You know, he would have been perfect in some of the situations we found ourselves in. You know, at the end of games, needing to hang on to you know wins, which we didn't. He would have been perfect to bring on. And, you know, sort of advise, to shout, to cajole people. He's that sort of player. And he was never used and utilised. And that was one big mistake I think Lamouchier made at the end of last season. Let's read a, or put a couple of these up then. Start with um, Greg Oram, uh, a bit higher up there. Oh, where's it gone? I've lost it. There it oh, is. Sorry. Nice no, I've got it. Samba, Christie, Warrell, McKenna, Ayanu, if that's how you say it. Freeman, Arta, Colback, Taylor, Graman, and Amiobi. So that's two up top. Uh, Dan Smith has also got two up top. Uh, Samba, Christy, Worrell, McKenna, Ribeiro, Arta, Colback, Freeman, Taylor, Graben. It might be the same 11. Andrew Chard. Um, and I'll read them out for people who are listening um, on iTunes after this. Uh, Samba, Christy, So, McKenna, Ayanu. Arta Goldback, Freeman, Mighton, Amiobi, and Graben. And I'll just read one more out so I think more come in. Uh, Paul Reed, Smith, Christie, So, McKenna, Ribeiro, Freeman, Arta, Colback, Taylor, Graben, and Amiobi. Right, I'll do mine and then we'll go uh, around the room, so to speak, with Sarah and Gary. Gary. So uh, this is probably um, a bit too attacking, but we'll see. Samba in goal, Christie, Worrell, McKenna, Ayanu as the back uh, four, uh, Arta and Sao uh, in central midfield, uh, both Arta pushing forwards, hopefully. Lolly and Graben out wide, uh, Lolly and Amiobi out wide, excuse me, and then Taylor and Graben playing together up front. 
which I think is all right. Sarah, what have you got? I think I, I would, if they can get it right, I think the 4-3-3 can work, but you are relying on your fullbacks to, to get forward and push forward more from midfield. But I would go with um, Samba, Christie at right back. Um, Centre-halves are tough. Probably McKenna and Worrell. Um, Ribeiro probably at left back because we've not seen Iona yet, so a bit unsure as, as to how he would look, although it looks like Ribeiro might might leave. Um, midfield, probably Colback, Sal uh, and Arta. And then up front, Lolly. Mm, oh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> Very Lolly. difficult, Sarah, isn't it? It is. It really is, yeah. Lolly, Graben and, and Amiobi. But then you're missing Freeman. Then I've missed Freeman out. And I think he, he can be a really good player. Yeah, I left Freeman out as well. because he, He's he was been fine. But I think he falls into the Carvalho trap a bit of how you get him in the mm. game. I mean, Forrest have to utilise him. Uh, I didn't pick Ribeiro because I think he's going. By the look of it, he seems so out of favour. And I didn't pick Colback because I've been a bit disappointed in Colback. But yeah. I think he gave him plenty of mitigation because he didn't play for a year. So I think he's going to need a bit of time to um, acclimatise. It's a tough ass to throw a bloke in for no football for a year and play four games and actually be dominating midfield. Um, so that's my take anyway. Gary, have you had a chance to pick an 11? I don't need to pick an 11 because it's down to the manager to get the system right first to then accommodate those players within that system. And until he does that and, and be more positive, then I don't think things are going to change. He's got to get that system right. It's got to be more positive. It's got to be more productive, more attack-minded. And if you get if you get in the players' minds what system they're playing and what you want them to do, I, I go back. I, I keep. I, I don't like keep mentioning Liverpool, but I have to because I couldn't believe how good they were. It's like the Barcelona team of old and the Spanish team that were winning everything. They were brilliant without the ball, but they pressed high. They were confidently pressing in the opposition's half. We don't do that. We leave Lewis Graben up by himself. We let the opposition have the ball and say, right, come and break us down. And I don't think we're good enough to do that. You know, we got away with murder at times last season, a lot of the time. And I mentioned that fact about the two games, you know, where we only came back and won two games where we went behind, which was Stoke, who were uh, having a terrible time at the, that point, and Luton. So that's very damning for me. Be, product, be, be more positive. Get your setup right. If it's 4 3 3, play it as a 4 3 3. Look at Liverpool. Yeah, they're not as good players as Liverpool, but you look at the system and put players in that system and say, right, you know, you, you can tell your fullbacks to, right, do what they do. You, you're not as good as they are. Your quality might not be as good going, you know, getting in the box and everything. Of course it isn't. But at least you can try to do that and pen teams in their own half, in their own box, and make it very difficult. Force them into mistakes deep in their half. Don't allow them to come out and play easy because that's what Forest do at the moment. Allow teams to come out. It's so comfortable for them to break forward. Yes, we've done well defensively, but you're always going to get found out because you're always under pressure. And you, you cannot expect a team in the Championship to play like that and, and get into the positions we need to get into. Yes, we got into the playoff positions, but I, I think we had a lot of luck. We rode a look at times. Um, and if he gets that right, if he, if he gets it in his own mind, right, I am going to be more positive. I am going to set this team up um, in a way that I think will cause problems for the opposition in their half. If he's brave enough to do that, I think we have the players in that squad who can do the job really well. It's not a bad squad, um, you know, with those players. If you get your right system and your right players in your mind to fit that system and practice on it in the training pitch and say, right, this is how it's got to be. Be brave. Close people down in their own hearts. Force mistakes. Don't sit back. Let us be proactive instead of negative. I think that's what we're all seeing at the moment. You ask the majority of Forest fans and they'll probably say the same. That squad is not bad at the moment. And I think with the right tinkering and the right positivity, you know, we can turn it round. Do you think once they get a couple of wins, they'll get going then? If the manager unleashes the shackles as you see it, do you think it's just a mentality thing as well? Well, what's the problem? Why, why not? It's not working what we're doing at the moment. So why not try something different? Why not go to up front? I, I had to more or less switch it off when he took uh, 
you know, one striker off and put another one on. I thought, right, let's go two. We need to win a football match here. And I watched how, you know, positive Huddersfield were. You know, they were going forward, flowing forward, getting players forward, getting people in the box. And they were always looking like they were more dangerous than we were. And why not look at other teams and say, well, we can tweak our team. We've got that sort of player in our team. But we don't. We stick with that same negativity and it just doesn't work. People know what we're about. And I think they find it easy to play against us. Let's turn our attention towards Bristol City a bit then, Sarah. I mean, do you think, is Lamucci that stubborn that he won't change it now? Or do you think he's going to... I don't know. The writing on the wall isn't the right phrase, but it's not working. Do you do you think that he he will adapt going into the Bristol City game, or do you think it's going to be a very similar setup and mentality to to Huddersfield? I think it, I think he, he they need a goal. They need to get a win. They need to they need to be positive. Um, I can't see him going with two up top though. Um, I mean, we've asked him about it, and he said he he, he would be prepared to do it. But it depends on Lewis Graben and, and Lyle Taylor being 100, percent and he don't he doesn't think that they both are at the moment. Um, so I, I can't see that happening on on Saturday. Um, so I think it will put I, I will think he'll probably go back to his four two three one kind of setup. Um, but... So I'll, you've made a good point there, Sarah. I, you know, he doesn't think that the two of them 100. Mm. percent Well, why is he buying players that we don't need in positions that we don't need? He's bought another goalkeeper. We don't need another goalkeeper, really. He's buying players in other positions that we don't really need. What we've lacked all the way through, if Lewis Graben had got injured, a bad injury, halfway through last season, we wouldn't have been in the position. We would have been in the bottom half of the table, without a doubt, because we've got nobody to replace him. We were lucky in that respect that he played that many games and he scored that many goals without getting injured. And it was crying out when Keeper Moore came up in the you know, the papers, I thought, yeah, that, that's going to be a decent, you know, that could be a decent buy. Gives us a different option. He's tall, he's strong, he's good at set pieces, he'll upset defenders. And to be fair, Taylor has, he has upset defenders. He mm. backs in, he's a little bit nasty, you know, he puts himself about, you know, totally different to Lewis. Um, so why not try and play those two up front? What has he got to lose at the moment? Because we've played four, lost four, haven't scored a goal, why not just say, right, let, let's just go for it. Bristol City, re, let's, let's remind everybody, top of the league. You know, they were good last season. They are difficult to beat. They're a very positive, attacking-minded side. And if you let, if you sit back against them and allow them to dictate, they'll just beat you. Simple as. So no, why not go positive and say, right, OK, we're going to surprise you here. We're going to go to up front. See what you think about that. You're going to practice for playing us with one up front, our usual way of play, and we'll break you down and we'll beat you. But if you play two up front and you 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 know you get your full backs bombing forward and you force them under under pressure in their own half, make them make mistakes, it might just surprise them. But we don't surprise anybody. It's predictable. And it's got to change because if it keeps being predictable, we won't win football matches. Gary, you're getting some love from the viewers. 100% agree with the legend. Although, like, well, I assume that's for you, Gary. It's probably not for me or Sarah. <laughs> That'll be Sarah. No, no, no definitely not. Uh, uh, Adam Woodward, I hope Savvy's watching this now and getting some ideas. Um, Sarah, is Guerrero meant to be that batting ram key for more option? Of we see, I haven't seen much of him. Is that is that the theory? Yeah, that? I think I think he's perhaps not in the same kind of mould, but he's he's similar. He's kind of a a big kind of a big lump but he, he brings that kind of style of play I think he's he's very different to Lewis Graben and Lyle Taylor he's a very different option um I, I don't think he'll start many games I think he's the kind of player that he perhaps bring on from the bench and hope that he he ruffles a few feathers and gets a few defenses going and, and tries to create problems um, and hopefully he gets a few goals and um I, I think it's just about he was about having a different option I think he was Perhaps something like, was something that Forrest lacked last season, so he can be something different to bring on off the bench. Can I can I just say something about you know the stats? I hate stats. I've never been a stats person because they can be so misleading. But with Forrest, they weren't misleading last season. You, you look, at, I look at every game, the possession, shots on target, and we've got to be one of the wor worst teams in the championship for a number of shots and shots on target. And we're always second in possession. 
So if you're going to have all those stats against you, you can't always expect to win matches. Uh, so playing that one up front again is is folly for me because you're not creating a great deal. You know, Lewis will be out of the game. I think somebody said he had four touches in one half of football or something, or 11 touches in another game in the first half. But that's because of the way Forrest set up. You know, he's not the sort of player who go rampaging across the pitch and, you know, close things down, go sliding in on defenders. He's never been that sort of player. Um, so it's it just doesn't make any sense to keep going. That's what I say. People now, football teams, look at every team in the league. They go through everything with a fine t- a tooth comb. They'll watch what you do, what how you have possession, where you have possession, where at areas you get in that will hurt them. They go through all that on a daily basis. I know for a fact. I saw Nigel Clough do it when he was at uh, when he was at Burton, when he was at Derby. You know, they went through things methodically and and changed things accordingly when they needed to, and that's a sign of you know doing things right. But if you're predictable, it's going to be difficult all the time because teams know they don't have to do a great deal defensively coming out because they've only got one player to deal with. If I, I could play centre-half now, I think, if playing against one striker, you know, because it's it it, it limits what you do. I, I played up front by myself, and I know how difficult it is. I did that in the European Cup final against Hamburg, and it's it's hard, you know, I had to run across the line, and it's the tightest I've ever been in a football pitch in my life. Um, so it, I think it's a little bit unfair. And if, you, if you're on the back foot all the time, and you win possession back like we do, Sometimes it's difficult to break and get players up to support Lewis because you're defending that deep because you're playing that negative. And then you tie yourselves out physically and mentally because you're desperate to try and get help to him. But you're having to run 40, 50 yards at pace to try and join in with him. And not everybody can do that. Not everybody has got the same pace. Some are fast, some are, you know, lopers. And it's not always easy, you know, to break out from the back on the counter. Um, you know, you can be a counter side at home and a counter attack side. You don't have to be a counter attack side away from home. You can do it at home if you've got the right personnel. But I just don't think we've got the right personnel in the right places at the moment. If we look at the upcoming, fi- we'll, talk, we'll do Bristol City predictions in a minute. If we look at upcoming fixtures in general, there's a big one coming up soon. So Bristol City, international break, Blackburn at home, who are absolutely flying at the moment, Rotherham. Who were no mugs, but you should be confident. And then the Derby game. Uh, how are you feeling about those, Sarah? Fearful or optimistic? <laughs> uh, at the minute, given recent form, I think it, you, you're bound to be a little bit cautious about going into, particularly that Derby game coming up. I know they haven't made the best of starts, so that's going to be one for the neutral. Um, Bristol City on Saturday, that's going to be tough. They're in great form. Um, I mean, they all they all look. They look hard when you're losing. Every game yeah, exactly. looks absolutely That's terrifying exactly. when you're losing. I'd be scared if we were playing Doncaster Port Butchers at the moment, the way we're playing. <laughs> that, that, that was Pete Taylor's favourite line. You know, Doncaster Port Butchers was one of the teams he, he threw in the mix at some point. And you know, you, whoever we play at the moment, you, you, you're fearful mm. because you know the confidence is that low at the moment. Not only haven't we got a point, we haven't got a goal. Yeah. And I think if they, just, if they get a goal, though, and they get a result... I think it can turn. You just need something to go for you. You just need, they need a, it be a lucky goal or, a, you know, scrape a, a 1 0 win or, or play well if they can, but just something. And then it can turn because that squad, that squad that they've got is really good. They've got some really good players there. They just need, they need the confidence. They just so need they're, something they're to do. They're not being used in the right way for me. You know, mm. It's all right having the players and a good squad, but you have to use those players to their maximum. And I don't think, you know, the majority of them are being used to the maximum. I think they feel they could give so much more and would give so much more if they were just given the rein to do that. I think they're just being held back from doing what they can do best. We've already talked about Cavallio and Silva. I think they were restrained from doing what they do best. And when you're an, when you're a, a creative player and you're being reined in, it's difficult because you, that's not your natural instinct. You want to get forward. You want to make things happen. You want to impress people. But the, the problem with that, that, as we've already spoke about, when they did get the ball in good areas, there were very little to hit and, and to pick out. 
because we were trying to make 60, 70 yards up from defending deep. And you can't always do that. It's 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 just not possible. Uh, we've had that many comments. The one I was going to ask about next has disappeared, so I'm sorry about that. But the question was, and forgive me if I can't find the person to ask it, was about Lamucci, Gary, about how much longer he can have if they're not winning by the international break, which is the next game. I mean, um, how, how much longer do you think a manager's got when um, they've invested heavily? He does need to start winning very soon, I guess, doesn't he? Well, if you go by uh, what we've seen at Olympiacos and at Forest with a number of managers, I, I'm not sure how many it is, but it's a lot. You saw what happened to Martin O'Neill, which you know I think surprised quite a few people at the time. Not a lot of people agreed with that. So I think he should have been given more time. Um, I think this game, because of the international break, uh, he was given this next game. I think some people might have expected it after the Huddersfield, if we'd have lost that, which we did. But I think because we had one more game before the break, um, if we don't win that, I think, unfortunately, that could be the end. Nobody likes to see managers sacked. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing, but it's the nature of the game of football. And if you're not doing it right, you know, you'll get somebody else in. And the, own, the, the disappointing thing for me is everything else is brilliant at the football club. That football club has been transformed off the pitch for me. Uh, they're doing everything they can for the fans. They're trying to get that new state, uh, stand built. There's a feel-good factor all around, but on the pitch. And that's the most important part. If you get that right and get that positivity with that squad you've got at the moment, things can turn in an instant. Um, whether, you know, he does go if they lose on Saturday, we'll have to wait and see, you know. Um, and if he does, is there any real need to rush into, you know, to get, you know, a new manager and a permanent manager, you know, get somebody in who could work with a squad like that? I mean, I've mentioned Nigel Clough's name, you know, before, not not, not this time, but before with other managers, because I know I, I know how he works. I, I know how he works with players. I know he, I've, I've seen it. I used to go up, you know, and watch what he did at, you know, at Derby and Burton, because I like to see training methods and things like that. And he invited me up uh, to, to go and see, you know, watch them train and things like that. And the players loved what he did. You know, it was positive. Uh, training was positive. They loved it. You know, he used to take them on, you know, sort of playing golf when, you know, they had a few games, they've got a few days off, things like that. And it lifts you as a player. You know, Brian Clough used to do that to us. He used to take us away. You know, you'd had about four or five games in quick succession. You might have lost one. Right, I want your passports. We're going somewhere. We're going to Calamalore. You know, and that lifts you as a player. And it, it needs that feel-good factor. It needs that positivity. And it's not always a new manager straight in, straight out like we've had before. Um, you know, Nigel's a friend, and I'm not just saying he's a friend. I wouldn't say it um, just as a friend because I know I know what he can do and I know the effect he has on a football squad. Um but, you know, Sabre Lamouche is still in the job at the moment and you just hope he wins this game on, on Saturday so the, the, the progression can be made and, you know, maybe he can turn things around. But people will speculate, as they always do, um, no matter what football club you're at. Managers don't get the chance anymore maybe to have as long as they need. It's modern-day football. It doesn't really happen. Um, so, you know, I'm sure they're looking at the moment behind the scenes, um, it, it's it's blatantly obvious that that's going to be what's happening if they do lose the game. Um, and a long list of you know managers will appear yet again. And it's about getting the right one this time. And uh, it's, it's going to be difficult no matter who goes in there because they've got 35 players in there. And, you know, a lot of those, are, like we've spoken, are going to have to go on loan. They're going to have to get rid of them if they'll go. And it's a hell of a job for anybody. So, Maybe if it does happen, you know, it, it, a standing manager might be the uh, the way to go forward. Um, see if somebody can turn it round in a in a short shortest space of time. Um, but that's down to you know the owner, and uh, you just hope if it does all go wrong that you know things can happen that can turn things around pretty quickly. But you know, no panic. Uh, it's an early season. If it was you know, another five or six games in and we'd still not win a game, then you'd be really, really panicking. 
but there's time to to put things right. Especially you said it, Sarah. I think we all realise how good the squad is. Uh, maybe no real outstanding standout players in there at the moment. We've always been desperate for strikers and creative midfield players. Um, you know, we've got experience in there now with Arta, uh, with Freeman. You know, you've got creative players in there with knowledge who can help around the dressing room, help in training. Um, and you've still got Michael Dawson there, I think can be very influential. So there are positives maybe to look forward to if things do deteriorate because the squad is good. It's not a rubbish squad and things can be done with that squad because there are very good attacking-minded players in there who I think if they were given the rein, I think might just surprise a few people and surprise the opposition a wee bit. At the moment, we're very predictable, needs to change, and we've got the players to do that. Uh, there's an interesting point here from Carl Eason I was going to ask you about, Sarah, about just on that theme, I thought about the lack of fans. I mean, if this was a packed house and Forest were playing like this, I think they'd be getting dogs abuse now. Do you, do you think that um, a lack of a crowd has probably bought Sabri a bit more time to try and turn it around? I think it's probably hurt Forest. I think they've suffered from not having the fans there. I don't think... I think there would have been games probably towards the end of last season and, and probably the start of this season that they, they wouldn't have lost if they'd have had their fans there, particularly away games. You know, when that the Forest away fans are so loud and so they get behind the team so much. They can win you games. They can get you over the line. They've not had that. Um but yeah, equally, when, when they're playing this badly and results aren't going their way, the crowd gets on your back. They'll boo you off. They'll, you know, you get abuse from the stands. That's it's bound to happen. Um, so I think it probably could have worked both ways. I think they've really suffered from not having fans in. I think they, they would have benefited from having the crowd in at the back end of last season, especially. Did you hear well, the fans a lot when you were playing, Gary? You heard the noise, but you didn't hear anything else. It was just a buzz in the background. Mm. I mean, I've been watching, you know, I watched a lot of the cricket. I've been watching the test matches. I've been watching a lot of the golf. And I think football has been affected more than any other sport because they, they rely on crowds more than cricket and I think than uh, golfers. You know, I've been really enjoying the golf. I think other players have come forward. Certain players have struggled. The top players, certain players at the top have struggled because of lack of crowds with the golf. But others have come forward and it suited their way of play. Cricket, I thought was brilliant. The test matches we saw, uh, the England games were, you know, were, were tremendous. And it didn't really affect them as much as footballers. And that's where mental strength comes into it. It's not about physical strength or fitness. Ment mentally, you've got to be strong. Some players can do that, others can't. And you see again, you go back to Liverpool, the start they've made. You know, you've got to applaud Brendan Rodgers at Leicester. You know, the start they've made. You know, crowd or no crowd, it doesn't affect them. Others, it has affected, you can see. And maybe it, the combination of last season's collapse and this season's start is taking its toll on players that were there and are still there uh, on ongoing. But that's got to change. You know, if sadly, you know, Lamusi does lose his job, it might change under a new manager. You know, we, you often look for that honeymoon period where things can, you know, suddenly change and results change we don't know it's all speculation um but you have to talk about speculation you, you have to say well it could happen um because all the you know the papers will say it the supporters will say it and we just have to wait and see it's a very it's probably one of the toughest games he could have had if his career is in the balance to save it because bristol city are a very good team not just this season they've started exceptionally well they were up and there, thereabouts last season by, you know, not by fluke. You know, they deserve to be where they were. And uh, it's a very difficult game that, you know, if we win it, you know, it could turn things around for everybody. If we lose it, you know, you sink further into a little bit of despair and the speculation becomes more intense. You know, the, the fans, uh, pressure from the fans becomes more intense. And the further you go down that line, the worse it becomes. You know, the the less you're winning, uh, the the worse it gets for everybody, and the players will feel that more than anybody else. Believe me, and it's it's up to the senior pros. That's why it's good that Art has come in, Freeman if Freeman's come in, that Michael Dawson's still there. These sort of players and McKenna, 
These are the players who can turn things round, not single-handedly, but by just being a presence in that dressing room, you know, talking the younger players round, giving them that encouragement. And, yeah, it's it's down to the manager in the end. He always takes the can, which I find very un- unfair uh, because players always get away with it. It's always the manager's fault. Players, it's never their fault. Um, always been that way. Always will be. Um, so, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens if the result goes against or if, the, if we win the game. If we win the game, I think he stays. And he's got a period then of the international break with the players he's brought in to really work on things, get the system he wants, hopefully a positive one. The players he wants within that squad, be brave enough to play them for four or five games so they can get used to each other because that's what you need to do. I keep calling it the scattergun effect because players keep coming in and out. There's no real cohesion between the squad at the moment, the team that goes out on the pitch. Um, so it's, it's it's a matter of doing all those things. After this Bristol City game, with that break, it's come at a good time that he can work on things and he can work with players. He can work with the system on the training ground every day. Say, right, we'll try this. We'll try that. Try different things. See if they work. And, you know, that's all you can do. And I agree with you, Sarah. With that squad, there are, p- there are possibilities, the potential to turn it round and just, let's just hope that happens. Right. We're going to have to wrap it up in a minute because I know that Sarah's got a meeting. And, uh, not another one. I'm moving the to Gary. <laughs> High-powered meetings all the time. So, uh, last couple of minutes, if people quickly want to drop their predictions in for the Bristol City game as normal. Uh, Sarah, you weren't on last week, so you were spared. But last week's predictions were, uh, I said Forest would draw 1-1 with Huddersfield, so I was wrong. And David Prutton said Forrest would win 2-0, so he was very wrong. He's uh, Sarah. Right, <laughs> I, I work with him. He's, he's a lovely lad, to be fair. He's a cracky <laughs> lad. But he, he, can't, he couldn't predict the day of his own birthday, really. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, what's your, joking, <laughs> what, what, what's your prediction, Sarah, before you have to leave her? Uh, I'll go with uh, nil-nil. Nil nil, that's good. Well, we're keeping it neat, Bristol City. <laughs> I think that would be a good result. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it depends on the, the, the side. I, I just hope he's in a positive frame of mind. If he plays a positive game, we can beat anybody with that squad, I think. If he's negative and goes exactly the same, I don't think we've got a chance of beating Bristol City. I think if he surprises them with his selection and he's, he plays with intensity in their half, with the players he's got, then we've got as good a chance of beating Bristol City as anybody. If we play the way we've been playing, they'll beat us. Uh, let's just flash a few up quickly on the screen. There's loads come in. So we'll just start with um, Nick Pennington. We will win 2-0. Um, Darren Price says, Keith Stroud is the ref, so take a 1-1. Uh, yeah, it's probably red cards, not goals. Um, Kev Watson, a 2-0 loss. Owen Bailey, uh, Keith Stroud effect. Uh Darren Beers, 2-0 loss, and on and on and on. Um, I am going to say 1-1 again. I think Forrest is going to get a goal and a point, and we'll see if that gets them going. I don't know if it will. Just going um, back to the Huddersfield game, let's, let's talk about referees. That decision in the first minute of the game, uh, that tackle on Arta, was an absolute disgrace, and it didn't even get a yellow card. You know, And if, if, if somebody gets sent off in that game, that's how things can turn. He gets sent off in the first minutes, which he should have been, and I hate this about referees at times. They give players the benefit of the doubt because it's in the first few minutes of a game. It doesn't matter if it's in the first few minutes of a game. If players know they're not going to get sent off, they'll keep doing tackles like that. You should be sent off for a tackle like that, whether you've been playing 10 seconds or 97 minutes. It was a red card, didn't even get a yellow, could have changed things around and didn't. So, you know, these things, it's like the last game of last season. Reading got a player sent off. Uh, against Stoke, didn't they, just before half-time. They're down to 10 men. They held on in the last... They got tired, and then the two goals came late on, which cost us our place. Things like that have gone against us a little bit, but, you know, you just hope they turn around. But let's hope he's positive Saturday. Don't be negative against a side like Bristol City because they believe in themselves, and we've got to believe in ourselves. Uh, You know, when, when we've got that team out there that looks the right team, 
to play the right system. Fingers crossed. Very true. Right. Uh, I'll thank everyone for joining us. We've had absolutely loads of comments more than ever on this. So thanks for everyone who watched along. Thank you, Sarah. I hope you enjoyed thank you. that. Thank you, Can Gary. I just, I Gary I you... just a quick one. Uh, you know, people think I'm negative. I'm, I'm so positive about everything that's happening at Forest, you know, because I've seen behind the scenes how good it is off the pitch and everything. And, I'm, you know, it's unbelievable what they're trying to do. It's just on the pitch. And I'm, I'm saying it because I'm passionate. I'm born and bred Nottingham. I was lucky enough to play for my hometown team. And I'm desperate as anybody for them to get out the championship and do well, no matter who the manager is. So it's just frustration. It's passion. I've always had that passion. I've always played like that. I was always very vocal on the pitch. And I won't stop being vocal because I want them to do well. You know, as simple as that. It's nothing to do with not liking anybody or anything else. I want, like every Forest fan, them to succeed, get out this championship, get into the Premier League. And that's, that, that's what it's all about. I'll never lose that passion for Nottingham Forest. Excellent. Gary, everyone loves you. So uh, loads of comments. <laughs> <about in>. <laughs> there they do. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. I must end by thanking people who've given us nice reviews on iTunes. Uh, we had some really good comments and five-star reviews there, and I do read them because I get a bit obsessed about this podcast. So uh, thanks for those. We'll be back next week. We'll gladly have Gary back on soon when his blood pressure's lowered. And, um, I'm on tablets for it, actually. So, so am I. So am I. I'm oh, 37 right, okay. and I'm on blood pressure tablets. It's ridiculous. It's these chins. I've got to lose a few. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to everyone who watched along and uh, we'll be back next week and hopefully forests are up and running when we talk uh, soon. So thanks very much, everyone. We'll catch you soon. Thank you. Thank you.